Well, buenos dias if you are in Mexico City. Good afternoon if you are on the east coast of the United States or South America. Buenos dias in South America. Bom dia in South America. Good early evening in London and the UK and all over continental Europe and Africa. Special love to our loved ones in Ukraine. Stay strong. Be yourselves. Greetings to people in Pakistan, Punjab, India, and all places east of there. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. As regular listeners to this program know, I like to introduce you to people, either some are very famous whom you know, but many are people who I have come to know, who I admire, who I am challenged by in the best sense of the word challenged, uh, who I find very young and bright. I like young, bright people, especially when they're bright and they're nice, as today's guest is as well. Um, his name is Vishnu Bachani, B-A-C-H-A-N-I. In other words, Bach. Anni is the easy way to remember that. Welcome, Vishnu. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's great to see you again after many years, and I'm, I'm honored that you would have me on here. So, as I recall, we met when you came to some of the classes I lead at New York University. Is that correct? It was before that. When I started I was... studying at NYU, I would go to the New York Philharmonic, and I remember that you gave one of the pre-concert lectures and afterward having some questions about the piece i approached you and asked some things and you gave me a business card and we kept in touch <laughs> <Okay. after that. laughs> back when people used business card and didn't hold up their smartphone to one another yeah exactly. and then i think you came to some of my adventures in italian opera at nyu which have yes. now begun thankfully again after the the worst part of the pandemic although we are still in the pandemic and I would run into you at Carnegie Hall, at the Met, at all over Lincoln Center, at other venues in New York City. And I came to know you as someone who not only likes, loves music, but knows a great deal about it. Now, you wrote your thesis on music, on musicology. We'll get into that. What was your actual major at New York University? Right. Uh, I had two. I did a double major. So one was in music, a Bachelor of Arts in music, not a Bachelor of Performance. And the other one was a Bachelor of Arts in mathematics, pure math. Right. So uh -huh. one topic I know a little about, the other topic I know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> but I know many people with a passion for mathematics, the thing I know nothing about, who also have a passion for music. And I use the word passion advisedly. Um there's a word in American English, nerdy, that is sometimes thrown about. I don't, I know people who consider themselves nerdy and like it and are proud of it. To me, it doesn't sound like the most flattering term, but I, to me, it's someone who's very into something that may be a little esoteric. And I don't think anything is esoteric, frankly. I think everything is interesting and certain things I can comprehend and connect with personally. And others, I know that mathematics is incredibly important and sexy to the people who like mathematics, but doesn't, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> so what is the appeal of mathematics? You know, it's funny, uh, pe people think I'm good at math because I have a math degree, but I also found it very difficult. And in general, <laughs> I was struggling through it. I mean, I did it because I, I, I thought it was logical and uh, you know kind of beautiful in a way to use a cliched expression that everything everyone says about math but uh it basically i think math is a structure uh, sorry it's the study of of structure right and so the way things work together patterns uh, change maybe it's it's all these very broad things that uh, you study in a very abstract manner disconnected from the real world and one thing that's nice about it is that it's it's a completely closed internal system. So you can actually prove things. You know, in science, you don't prove things. You make theories about how things work. But it's it's never a proof. My high school physics teacher used to say, 
everything we know as a theory in science is just a really, really good idea that has yet to be disproven. But in math, it's not the case because you define the rules and then things can close perfectly. That was something I liked about it and something that I also saw in music theory that is sometimes a little bit confusing because people, you know, music is an art. People think music theory is maybe also an art, but really it's more rigorous. I mean, certain things do work certain ways. You do have a limited number of chords, scales, keys, tones, all these things. And there are some basic similarities in between in in between music and mathematics and that they're both highly structural disciplines that 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 aren't necessarily subject to the kinds of uh, ambiguities that you find in, in many other disciplines, including the social sciences, which I'm doing now. Well, I will get to what you're doing now in a moment. You anticipated a word that I was going to ask you next. I was going to ask you, is mathematics, are mathematics, I don't know if it's singular or plural, is mathematics abstract or not? If you talk about it, it's having a closed set of rules uh maybe they are literal and comprehensible to people such as yourself but um to me it's an abstraction because i mean we have to preface my saying that i did fine in school except for mathematics which was uh -huh. really my weakest subject and my math teachers had to labor very hard to get me to understand the basics of something that just did not make sense to me at all and i was not against it but i did not have the structure in my mind the processes the synapses to connect to math never mind having a passion for it and so therefore i learned the very basics i passed my math courses i surprised everyone by doing pretty well on the standard academic test, the SAT. By doing quite well on my math exam, and I thought there must have been a mistake. But um, but nonetheless, I who live in music and understand that math can be one explanation of what music is, I see music as both an abstraction and something literal and tangible to me mathematics may not be tangible maybe that's the word we want to use to talk about this um but i guess i, I you know i i embrace your loving math I, I went to a specialized high school in science and math actually not i could have gone to music and art high school i was accepted but my family urged me to go toward the sciences and the sciences were fine but it was the math and we had brilliant students in my school who went to ivy league schools after and did lifetimes in mathematics so i saw and respected that but to me i can explain music mathematically probably not as well as you can i can do it but to me what music represents is not that to me i i as i said i think the correct term is i live in music and yesterday i had something some music going through my head and i knew that i knew it it was i was listening to Mahler, but it was not Mahler. and suddenly i realized it was basically the last three minutes of Mozart's La Clemenza di Tito but to retrieve that music in my head it took me a while to realize that where it came from so I live in it I, you know you know that I worked a lot with James Levine and he always said to me that he could be conducting La Boheme or Die Valkyrie or whatever and have that in his head but when he steps away from it automatically it's replaced with some other music in his head and he permanently walked around with music in his head. I, I understand that. I've never owned earbuds, Walkman, any of those devices. I don't need it. I have the music playing all the time. Mm -hmm. And it can be wonderful. It can be very distracting. And especially when I'm listening to Mahler, but I have late Mozart going through my head. Although sometimes you realize that there are connections. You hear something 
in Mahler, and if it recalls Mozart, or if you hear something in Schubert and it recalls Beethoven, as I've seen happen, um, then you can make those connections. So it's a very happy state of mind to be in, but it's not definable. There are not laws that happen for me. The law is it has to be good, is all. Yeah. Um, talk about music in your head and how you live music and whether when you hear music in your head or in a concert hall or on a recording or on a dojo, do you hear the musical structure mathematically? Do you hear the abstraction of what the composer has written? What do you hear? Well, uh, I, I'm generally in favor of the thesis that music is not math and math is not music. I mean, it's obvious there are different things, but I would even go f so far as to say that using mathematical tools to understand music is maybe even more often than not, not so useful. I mean, there exist math conferences, there exist, sorry, math music conferences and uh, mathematical musicologists too, but I've seen more than one uh, article or paper or presentation that, uh, uses a bunch of very complicated mathematics only to say in the end something like, so now we know that this piece by Beethoven has uh, 35 C-sharps. It's not really useful for musicians, for performers, for listeners, not, not, not really for anyone. It's, you just draw a nice little diagram. What I uh, think is more apt for understanding music and the approach that I use in my undergrad thesis is maybe something closer to linguistics. So music doesn't have theorems, math has theorems, music doesn't have proofs, math, math has proofs, music also doesn't have equations, math has equations, but uh, music does have a grammar, it does have a, a periodic structure, it does have a syntax, it does have the basic things that you find in a language, uh, in a spoken language, I mean, of course you cannot say, uh, go to the store and get me a liter of milk in a, in a piece of music without lyrics, but you can say it's things that are more complicated than just happy or sad. And that has to do with the linguistic structure. So everybody listens in different ways. Uh, and, you know, certain music, I think, is uh, is more prone to being understood after some familiarity. So not on the first listen. Other music is uh, you know, very easy to understand on, on the first listen. It kind of depends on the the, the methods it uses. So everything is a different experience, but sometimes, yeah, I do hear like linguistic things in music, you know, very basic examples like a cadence, uh, a cadence will end a phrase, a, a perfect cadence can be similar to an exclamation mark in, in a spoken or a written language. It's a strong end to something, you know, that the next thing that begins is not related to the previous thing. And I think uh, I would say that most people hear these things, even if they don't know the vocabulary for it, you know, but the same thing happens in a spoken language. You know, a five-year-old doesn't know what an adverb is, but if you tell them a sentence, they're going to understand what you're telling them, even if they may not be able to identify the parts of speech. Similar thing happens in music where people are able to get the effects of it. And it doesn't matter if you know what a cadence is or if you know what a dominant chord is, you're going to understand what's going on if you're familiar with the language. And familiarity with the language doesn't mean knowing the parts of speech of the language. When I teach music to people who are not music literate, they can't read music, and they sometimes feel intimidated, I don't understand what I'm listening to is what they say. And that could be symphonic music, that can be an opera, it could be any kind of music, frankly, it could be jazz, but the thing is, the difference between the two, between symphonic and opera and symphonic and different kinds of jazz and rock and everything is some have words and some don't have words. So the notion of understanding is different when you hear the words or perhaps read projected titles and translation of the words and you think, oh, I understand that. But often people I meet, unless they're very small children, and I do teach small kids, feel that they either pass or fail that they have to understand everything and be analytical. And I, even now with all of my experience in music, know how to turn off my analytical faculties when I listen to music, especially music I know already. 
So for example, if I'm going to see Verdi's La Traviata, I've seen it 200 times. I know every note. I know every word. But that doesn't mean that I listen to be reminded of what I know. But I listen as if for the first time. And I experience Violetta and Alfredo and her his father and her situation for the first time. And each time I listen, as opposed to hear, each time I listen, I discover new things in Verdi's brilliant score. And it's not just La Traviata, it's hundreds of pieces. And that's opera. But let's say I'm listening to Dvorak's Seventh Symphony, which is not something I hear very often. I love it, but I don't hear it often. So each time I hear that, I listen carefully. I learn and discover many new things. And I teach that our relationship to music is not about passing a test, but about establishing a lifelong relationship with these works that we return to, that return to us. The fact that La Clemenza di Tito was ringing in my head yesterday, but just three minutes of it repeatedly, um, means it's been in my head for a long time. And something summoned it yesterday. And it was very nice to hear it. I didn't have to go to the score and look at it. I, I know it. Um, but academics feel, I could, people who work in academia, I mean, feel that they have to show their knowledge, whether it's the 35 C sharps or whatever it is you said. Um, uh -huh. And I tell people, turn off the analysis, turn on your senses. And for so many things, we would experience it differently because we have a sense memory. So I'll tell listeners now that you are in Mexico where I'm reaching you, and we'll talk about that later. But you have lived in London. You've lived in New York. You were born in London. You have family from South Asia. And therefore, conceivably, there are many flavors and smells that you will have encountered. And perhaps there is food in Mexico that uses ingredients that might be familiar from India, Pakistan, such as coriander is something that appears in both. There are other flavors as well. You probably have encountered coriander just or cilantro, as it's sometimes called, in London, in New York, certainly. And therefore, Coriander cilantro becomes a connective thread, a through line in your experiencing of that taste and smell. But we use all of our senses and build up a library in our heads and our bodies and our cells of knowledge that we don't necessarily recognize or, or know exists within us. So therefore, this, I believe, notion of having to appreciate, having to know, having to understand, in all of our sensorial pursuits is a waste of time. And that's just my view. And I get a lot more pleasure out of being Parsifal or Candide, being an, an eternal innocent who discovers new things all the time. How do you feel about that? Because you're a young man. I'm older than you are, but considerably. And uh -huh. therefore, you can approach your senses maybe in a different way than I do. Well, I would say that it's uh, like listening to something analytically or not. It's not necessarily mutually exclusive. You know, all, all kinds of things happen. Neurocognition is not very well understood. And music psychology and music and music cognition are kind of relatively nascent disciplines that still i think largely are not as concretized or advanced as musicology and music theory so it's kind of a big black box in some sense but i would say that uh, many times um, you can enhance your experience of something by understanding how it works uh, that doesn't mean that before you understood it you weren't under you weren't getting it you weren't intuiting it properly it just means that you can maybe appreciate it in a different way. And I'll give an example so that people can understand what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll try to make it, make it accessible. The beginning of uh, Mahler's 10th symphony opens with this viola soli, uh, meaning all the violas are, are playing this, this one melody. 
it's it's not really clear what key they're in there, there's no perfect cadence there's no clear end of phrase but by the time they get to the end of their soli one senses that they're about to land at a tonic a tonic meaning the 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 first chord or the first note of a key and regardless of whether or not you know which one uh you, by name i mean the the one that they're suggested to land on is is f major because the the whole melody they've been playing is in f major yet when the orchestra comes in the the rest of the instruments after the viola soli at the beginning it's actually an f sharp major they start playing an f sharp major you can you can analyze this in the score and figure out what's happening or you can just listen but either way uh if you are familiarized generally with tonal music you know you're, you're not an uncontacted tribe who's never heard any note of western music if you're one of these people which is majority of everyone you're going to hear that when the orchestra comes in something is wrong like they're, they're not responding to the thing that they're, they're not responding in the same key that were that the violas were playing in so some effect is there and regardless of whether you've uh, taken the a pen or pencil and marked up the score and, and looked at what's happening the effect is felt uh, and that's the point that's that's the point of the beginning of that symphony is that something is amiss later in the in, towards the end of that movement we realize it's a much bigger problem and it explodes into a big chord uh, so on and so forth in the in the following movements but you find this all over music that um that there are mechanisms used by composers to achieve certain effects and the 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 validity of that effect or whether or not it works is independent of of whether you've analyzed it or not same thing applies to other senses i would say I'm, i don't really know so much about them but uh after having studied music for a while uh this is this is i think what i took away from from music theory is that it's not necessary for the listener it's useful for composers it can also be useful for listeners it can help your appreciation but uh it's it's not something that you you need and therefore when you when you as you said as you're teaching music to people who are musically illiterate or who don't read scores it also shouldn't be necessary music theory should not be presented as this big ivory tower thing that people have to read several textbooks and go through years of harmony and counterpoint to understand no it's simple things it's it's simple understanding how rules work and what effects they cause and it shouldn't be treated as something that's necessary to appreciate music otherwise we would have very few people who appreciate music it wouldn't make any sense true define tonality please right <laughs> this is a very uh polysemous meaning it has multiple meanings very polysemous word um the most common definition is the system of western music tonality also called the tonal system which divides the octave which is two pitches separated by a frequency either double or half of it in hertz that divides the octave into 12 distinct tones which we call c c sharp d d sharp e so on and so forth up until you get back to c it divides the octave into 12 tones and then from that 12 tone scale called the chromatic scale it chooses subsets of seven tones which are called major and minor scales and it uses those scales to organize the musical material the tonal system or tonality is a musical language so to speak that uses this subset of sound this subset of notes that you can obtain from an octave with relationships in between the notes in the scale to create music you have certain relationships the first chord of a scale is different hierarchically from the fifth chord in the scale so on and so forth there's a number of rules that that define tonality and there's a number of uh, consequences you could say that results from these rules which are then exploited by composers to create musical effects part of my 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 claim in my thesis was that tonality has endured as a musical language for hundreds of years and has spread to many continents not only for anthropological reasons not only because of european colonialism and other factors non-musical factors that led to the diffusion of tonality but also because it's a useful language uh, you can express things that you may not be able to express in other musical languages um we can get into some of those if you like but th th this is what i think distinguishes tonality from from other musical languages in simplest terms when people ask me what tonality is i always say it feels good well that's subjective right i mean not everyone I, says for i mean for the listener 
So well, now, defi <laughs> now define atonal. Atonal is well, I, I guess it's any music that's not tonal. But in the in the context of Western music, it was a movement that came around at the beginning of the 20th century where certain composers said that we have exhausted the possibilities of the tonal system, and now we're going to democratize all the notes. Every note is going to be equal in value, and uh, we're not going to have a key or a, a, a key note or a key tone that that centers the other tones around it. So atonal music is is like this. There, there's no central note, but rather you have different methods of musical organization. It could be a tone row, which is a set of tones within the chromatic scale that's organized in a certain way. It could be free atonality, which is not based on a tone row, but just uses the different notes of the scale independently. I don't know. I mean, whether or not it's better is like an aesthetic question. It's not a it's not a question for musicologists. Oh, I wouldn't even go to better or worse and so on. It's just that uh, I converse with a lot of composers just privately but sometimes on a dojo sometimes at the new york philharmonic and i tiptoe around this concept of tonal atonal but recently i was chatting with a composer and he said to me that someone approached him with a commission and said to him but i hope it's tonal because he the the person who commissioned it wanted for the place where the music would be presented something tonal that was what the commissioner wanted it's kind of like someone going to a painter and say please paint a painting but make it not abstract make it yeah palpable make it let us recognize what we're looking at so to speak sunflowers are sunflowers no matter how you do them they are sunflowers unless they really don't look like sunflowers but maybe sunflowers so i don't take a position because i'm of the duke ellington school duke ellington said there are only two kinds of music good music and the other kind and we know it and i'm open to all kinds of music because of that um going back a bit to the issue of mathematics and music um your first your last name b-a-c-h-a-n-i many people i know who are very into mathematics are very very into johann sebastian bach and i think because i'm not way into mathematics it's not that i don't love the music of bach but i don't get into bach that way I get into Bach for all kinds of other reasons. But people I know who are mathematically inclined and musically inclined and often medically inclined, I know many doctors who are very into the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Do you go there mathematically with Bach or are you interested in more contemporary composers mathematically? Well, I'm talking just math right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't... I. I probably don't get into Bach that way. My favorite composers are from the late Romantic period. And Bach is, uh, of course, a great composer and has very interesting works, some of which are mathematically interesting too, like the palindromic canons, for instance. Um, and it's good music and everything. And I didn't spend so much analytical time studying or discussing that music. And I've seen some works that some uh, academic scholarship that is that treats Bach in that way, but it was never super interesting to me. In general, the field of mathematical music theory was something that didn't interest me so much because I felt that the musical applications were rather limited, or maybe you put another way, the practical applications were rather limited. It, mostly, it was about drawing nice nice charts and graphs rather than trying to understand something. Is there a composer's work? who in general, and I mean of the ones we all know, not someone very esoteric, that you just don't connect with either mathematically or physically, because I always experience a physical connection to composers. I tell people always that the two I most connect with physically are Rossini and Berlioz, which doesn't mean I think they're the greatest, although I love them. But there is just a very strong palpable physical connection maybe the way my heart beats the way the blood pumps through the system connects to berlioz and rossini in particular ways and there are some composers i don't have that physical experience with is there any of the majors that you are not 
physically connected to, so to speak? Yeah, I'll give two answers. Uh, one of them, which will probably anger a lot of people, and one of them, which will not. Uh, I don't really like Mozart. Almost okay. everything I've heard is like overly jocular, too happy. Like it just feels unrealistic to me. And the other one, which I think shouldn't be so angering, is Max Reger, the early early 20th. I don't know how esoteric you consider Max Reger to be, but uh, yeah. For most I mean, people Reger, it would be, but yeah. Uh -huh. Reger was a student of Hugo Riemann, kind of this heterodox mm -hmm. uh, music theorist who proposed theories that kind of fell out of uh, all scholarship later. So his music is kind of abstracted. You know, it, it follows these it follows these theories of Riemann, and I think they don't really work. I mean, my my music my thesis supervisor said Reger gives him a headache. I haven't really <laughs> listened long enough to like corroborate that, but I can generally agree. When I teacher i'm asked about teaching music to beginners people always say oh start with mozart mozart for babies mozart for geniuses my answer is no mozart is hard mozart is actually very very hard and in my teaching mozart does not come up until maybe the fourth or fifth class because he's hard I have a very dear friend in Sweden, Stephen. If you're listening, we're talking. I'm about to talk about you. Um, I don't see him often. He's a dear man, and I was in Stockholm maybe 15 years ago, and had two tickets to see Don Giovanni at the Royal Swedish Opera. And I said to Stephen, "Hey, I have two tickets to go see Don Giovanni. Let me invite you." And we had not seen each other for a while, and he said okay <laughs> and he's a very cultured man and i said you don't sound thrilled he said well i'm very happy to see you but it's mozart <laughs> and a few years later he was in new york and he was just here for a night and i said you know i have tickets for the met for lenozza di figaro with a fantastic cast let's go you're my guest do i have to <laughs> and i i asked him why and he used a term that was stuck in my head ever since he said i don't have the mozart gene mm. so he can love all kinds of art and culture he's a very open catholic small c catholic in his tastes about the arts in general he's not judgmental but he does not feel mozart and i don't criticize that but i it strikes me because even some composer as great as Mozart is, I think we can all agree, does not reach everyone. And that's why there's very little right and wrong to me in, in how we approach music. My only consideration there would be is not so much, do we like this composer or do we not like that composer, is how well is the performer performing that composer's music? Mm -hmm, yeah. Because... I can remember some early performances I heard of Bruckner that maybe it was just not a good performance. Uh -huh. And it took me a very long time to come to Bruckner. I know that you are deep into Bruckner. I, I'm not. I'm still on my learning curve. And that's the great thing about loving music is I can still learn. Michelangelo, I was quote at the age of 82, said, Ancora imparo, I'm still learning. And that was Michelangelo. And so therefore, sometimes you're it's not the music, sometimes it's the performance. And sometimes yeah. you're just not ready. My other famous example, I'll keep brief, is when I first saw Madame Butterfly, I was in Bologna, Italy. I was 22. Apparently it was a terrific performance. I just didn't get it. I didn't understand the emotions. I didn't understand all kinds of things at the age of 22. But now I love Madame of Butterfly. I think it's just a fantastic opera, one of Puccini's two or three best, a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination. And that's why we live with music and it's part of us all the time. Um, I read your thesis. Oh, wow. <laughs> Preparation. Congratulations on making it through. Uh, I got through. Um, <laughs> I didn't understand everything. That's okay, because it was written for um, a particular audience. But I want to read just a couple of things from it. Um, in your preface, you had a quotation from Marshall Tuttle, who I gather is a very influential 
academic and intellectual figure in your life who wrote, while music is an art with all that that implies, music theory is a rigorously logical structure. The goal of music theory is to provide a description of materials and procedures used in musical discourse of the repertoire under study to accurately resolve compositions, and that's what I want to ask you about, resolve compositions into their component parts and demonstrate their internal relationships and to provide procedures for the creation of new compositions. Um, what does is, what is resolving a composition mean? Well, uh, resolve is again, uh, uh like a polysemous word but i think in this in this context it's using the the word in the sense it's used in chemistry like you take a solution and you resolve it and it becomes uh, the things that comprise the solution so the similar thing is that a composition is a like a combination of musical elements notes chords grammar syntax all that and the point of analysis or the point of music theory in this case is to identify what those things are, how they fit together, and why they're put together in that particular way. Resolve not in the sense of solving a problem, rather in the sense of breaking something apart, like in chemistry. Mm -hmm. So you then asked in your thesis in direct response to that, what is music? How does it work? Why does it work? And I made a note that these questions underpinned the academic disciplines of music theory, musicology, music psychology and music cognition music theory i think we've discussed musicology you want to give a quick definition to well yeah it's interesting because the american and british english use it differently i think i'm frozen us are you there (laughs) the so musicology we're having a uh, a freeze in our internet connection between new york and mexico city and perhaps johan in berlin Ah, okay, I can still hear you, but your your video got frozen. Can you hear me? Okay, it's just me, apparently. <laughs> okay, it's just okay. you, Fred. I think so, I'm back now. So please, if you would, uh, did you define musicology and I didn't hear very, it? Very briefly, I was just going to say that uh, musicology is is the study of music analytically. Uh, and the way that that word is used in British English and German Musikwissenschaft is holistic. It doesn't separate out the things that it does in American English. In the U.S., there was a war, well, like a soft academic war in the 70s in between the American Musicological Society and the Society for Music Theory. The AMS accused SMT, the music theorists, of uh, not taking into account cultural and other you know, non-musical factors in their analyses. And the music theorists accused the musicologists of not taking into account the notes and the score and the, and the musical factors. So then they split. Uh, now they have their own disciplines. Now, if you study musicology, you generally don't do so much score analysis, harmonic analysis. Now, if you study music theory, you generally don't do, in the US, I mean, you don't do so much uh, like holistic cultural studies, anthropology, things like this. In the rest of the world, which was not part of this war, musicology remains the holistic academic study of music. Wow. And music psychology, I want to get into that more with you, but just define music psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very briefly, it's like the the study of how music affects people. So the, the the discipline comprises usually empirical studies. You play music for people, and you ask them what key they heard it in, things like this. So it's a uh, music theory is more abstract because it's just about how grammar and syntax work. So it, technically, it's independent of how somebody hears it. But music psychology is focused on the listener. In other words, how the listener experiences music, as opposed to the creator who creates the music. Or the well, performer who performs the music. Yeah, I would say music theory is independent from all of those because it's just about how music relationships work together. So once you start saying... No, oh, I mean music psychology. Sure, sure. So m- music psychology is, yeah, I think generally about the hearer. Okay. The and finally, music cognition. I mean, a this is... carefully a, chosen word. Yeah, the, these, these are sometimes used interchangeably, music cognition and music psychology, but music cognition is probably more closer to neuropsychology. It's more like brain studies, like how do people perceive keys? You know, how is the brain processing music? This, this kind of thing. We know already of a lot of studies and, and documented examples of people we send videos 
who lose a lot of their cognitive function in all kinds of ways, unfortunately. But when played music, they can recall music and they can sing it. A very famous example that I give on this is I've been very active for many years at the home in Milan that Verdi built for retired musicians. And because people are living longer and many of the people there have very good full lives, even in their 90s. But there are some few people there who are in a different wing now who receive additional care because they have dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever. And not too long ago before the pandemic, so this would be October of 2019, I went to visit and visit a lot of the residents as I often do. And I was presented to a lady who was 82 and she had been a chorus member in the Arena di Verona, the opera company in Verona that's done in the summer. Mm -hmm. And she didn't remember much of anything, but she said to me, would you like me to sing something for you? And I said, of course, please, in Italian. And even though it was the Verdi house, she sang Puccini, she sang Visi d'Arte from Tosca very well, knowing all the words, knowing all the music, completely in key. It was a very, very more than presentable performance, especially by an 82-year-old of this uh -huh. aria. And afterwards, I thanked her, and she said, for what? And I said, for you just sang Visi d'Arte. She said, no, I didn't. And so sadly, she didn't remember what she had just done. But I witnessed that she perfectly knew the words and the notes and somehow music and the words that go with it embeds differently in the brain than perhaps a lot of other knowledge. Um, so to me, that is music cognition. Mm -hmm. Music psychology, as it happens, I saw a film very recently that I had never seen that I'd always wanted to see. I had no idea what it was about. It was called The Seventh Veil, and it was made in the United Kingdom in 1945, and it starred Anne Todd and James Mason. And there were many films by Hitchcock and others in the 1940s that went very heavy on the psychology and the psychoanalysis and so on. And Herbert Lom, who later became a comic actor and then a figure in James Bond films, um, played a prematurely gray psychiatrist who works with the Ann Todd character, who was a concert pianist who suddenly stopped playing because something mentally blocked for her. Mm. And the psychiatrist theory was, like Zalame, we can remove two or three veils. That's what we do with all of our friends. For someone you're more intimate with, you may re remove four or five or even six, but it's the seventh veil that I have to remove to help this patient get well again. And we're not talking about undressing. We're talking about getting to the core of her mind and her issues. And he used music. He used all kinds of piano music because the woman was a concert pianist to reach her. And apparently each piece of music was equated with an experience in her life. And this was not dementia. It was trauma that led to her completely blocking off from music and from life until she was brought back. And James Mason played a very complicated character who was part of her problem and part of the solution. I don't want to give it away. But this film so impressed me because I don't think I've ever seen a film in which music was used for psychological breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. I've seen people love music and be enchanted by music and sing in choruses and so on and music. All of that is fine. But this was the first film I'd ever seen where it was not film music, a la Hitchcock, but it was classical music by Mozart, by Grieg, by Schumann, by Beethoven and others that did the trick psychologically. So having seen recently the film and then having read your thesis and, and pondering music psychology, it took on a new meaning. And that was a bit of a long digression. But do you see music psychology 
tell me how you see music psychology. You defined it, but there's a difference between definition and how you see it. Sure. I mean, to me, it was because it's an empirical science, because it deals with uh, people and how they perceive things. To me, it was always a little bit uh, uninteresting, I guess, because uh, the, the, the basic truth of how people perceive music is that people perceive music the way that they're trained to hear. If you've listened to tonal music your whole life, you will hear tonal music and you'll understand it in that way. There are some good music psychology papers uh, about people, uh, about anthropologists and musicologists going to uncontacted tribes or very isolated people in Papua New Guinea and other countries where they where you still have these tribes and playing them canonical works like Beethoven. And the basic gist is that they say it's not music or it's not good music or something of that of that sort. So that should that should be clear proof that, uh, that there's nothing inherently musical or maybe inherently good, however you want to say it, about these canonical works that everyone in the in who has been exposed to Western music might agree is is canonical. So if if we take that, then music psychology basically boils down to well, understanding how music affects somebody basically depends on them and their training, their musical training doesn't mean like their musical uh, education, just like what they've heard and what they've listened to before. And sure, it can be interesting as a as a science to figure that out. Maybe it's uh, it has a lot of applications clinically, you know, if you're trying to uh, heal patients, this can be an interesting thing. But I think if you're trying to understand uh, the things that make music tick, like the things that I asked at the beginning of my thesis, what what is music? How does it work? Why does it work? You'll get a more rigorous answer by looking at the material rather than by trying to analyze the person because the because there's so many more variables with the person. The material is just there. The, the grammar exists independently. There are 12 tones to the scale, whether or not you like it. It doesn't matter if you hear 13. That, that, that's just how many there are. So if you have more rigor in that way, uh, to me, maybe because I also have a mathematical background, it feels like you're making some kind of progress. Whereas with the more empirical sciences or with music psychology in particular, it's a bit uh, hand wavy or slippery because it's so dependent on factors that change. You reminded me of something you didn't intend to, and I hadn't thought about this for years, but when I was a teenager, so the 1970s, I lived in Bologna, Italy, and I studied at their conservatory. I was the first foreigner to study there. It was called DAMS, Depart Departimento di Arte, Musica e Spettacolo. And it was very much the formation of my work as an opera worker and someone who works in the arts happened there. And they had what was called a discoteca, which was not a place to dance, but a place to sit down and listen to LP recordings, uh -huh. discs, 33s. And they had Aretha, they had a recording by Aretha Franklin, who I love. And living in Italy, I really missed Aretha Franklin because I didn't hear her on the radio. She was still very active in her own career in the 70s, of course, had a lot of great things to still do. And they had one Aretha Franklin recording. And I borrowed the LP and I sat down and I put on the LP and I put on the Kufier, the hearing, the, um, what do we call them? The headphones. Headphones, thank you. <laughs> and there was an extra set of headphones and at a chair and a young black man, a student came by and he asked, could he sit down and listen to what I was listening to? Of course. Um, and he put on the headphones and listened to Aretha. And I was practically dancing in my chair. And he sat stock still, his hands folded. He didn't, his body never moved. He just listened. And at the end of the recording, I said to him in Italian, because that was our common language, would you like to hear again? He said, no. I said, what did you think of this? He said, I didn't like it. And I said, where are you from? He was from Senegal. So his first language was French. He didn't speak English. And I said, was there anything about the beat, the music, the voice, the rhythm, the cadence, anything that you liked about this? He said, no. 
And I said, let's listen to it again. And we sat and listened to it again. I told him what some of the words meant. I said, what did you think? He said, nothing. So it was kind of like my friend Sweet in Sweden, Stephen, who doesn't have the Mozart gene. This fellow from Senegal just seemed not to have the Aretha gene or the soul gene or something. And I just sort of thought that he would respond more. And then a Nigerian was there and I said, please, in, in English, I said this, please sit down, listen to this music if you don't know it and tell me what you feel. And afterwards he said, oh my God, it's fantastic. The rhythm, the cadences, the rubato with which Aretha Franklin sings, all mm. of that, I loved it. And it was a lesson again that, you know, even something as great as that is not universal. And, you know, I think if I took Aretha Franklin's music to Papua New Guinea, a lot of people would like it, and maybe some would not like it. And it's such an important lesson because people such as ourselves who are deep into music may sometimes feel, God, how come you don't experience this the way I do? And we just have to accept that there are people who don't. It's it's very obvious for people who have like more eccentric tastes, like Bruckner, like you mentioned. I mean, people hate Bruckner with a passion. You can read the contemporaneous reviews of Edward Hanslick or Brahms. Yeah. Brahms calls Bruckner symphonies uh, symphonic boa constrictors. So ever <laughs> since Bruckner's lifetime, he's been constantly hated. And for Bruckner fans, I think we all understand that it's like a acquired taste or something that not everyone enjoys. Well, as listeners know, I often ask my guests to pick music from the Adagio catalogs that appeals to them, that is meaningful to them. And you pick the one Bruckner symphony that I entirely get into is the fourth. Nice. Um, you also pick the eighth, which I'm still working on. I went and listened to it again. Um and then I had to do a lot of reading about Bruckner as a result, because I wanted to talk to you about him, not as a musician, but as a man. And both recordings were the Munich Symphony Orchestra, and I don't know the the correct pronunciation of the last name, but Sergio Celibidake was yeah, a yeah. Romanian conductor. Uh -huh. And when I, I, I had heard him perform in my lifetime, but um, I did some research about him and his relationship to music and to Bruckner. And he was a Zen Buddhist. Did you know that? Well, allegedly. I mean, he had interest in Zen Buddhism. Uh, he had an interest Buddhism. in it. Yeah. But um, at a certain point, he wrote, the beginning is the end. Music is the materialization of this principle. Uh, what does that mean to you? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like Shelley Bidaka says a lot of uh, kind of like philosophical babble that doesn't make so much sense. I don't know what that specific statement means. So what is it about his performances of Bruckner? Because clearly, I mean, I was raised more in the George Schulte version of Bruckner. Uh -huh. What is it about Shelley Bidaka that appeals to you in terms of performing Bruckner? Well, the, the obvious kind of, kind of superficial uh, takeaway is that it's much slower than all the other Bruckner conductors, but uh, it's not, that's not really what it's about. And Jelly Bedaka himself says this. It's really about making the elements heard. And uh, one particular moment where you can really feel the difference is at the end of the fourth symphony, the coda to the finale, um, you have these, uh, these undulating strings and then this brass chorale, and then the rest of the orchestra comes in. At the tempo that Celibidaka takes it, you can really hear it in an almost modular way. Uh, every triplet sounds like a deliberate triplet. It's, it's, not, it's not like this wavy thing that you hear in, in, in other recordings where it's kind of just like a background of, uh, of uh, oscillating notes um, or a tremolo. No, it's like a triplet for the sake of being a triplet. Um, and uh, you you hear a different sense of the the elements fitting together. It's also interesting for a music theorist to to hear music in this way because it's it it sounds almost a little bit more deconstructed than you would expect from a finished piece of music. It's almost like you're analyzing it in a in a performance. I don't know. Like uh, the, 
if you talk too much about this, then it also becomes subjective, and it's you know it, you can't really say many very many insightful things. But this this appealed to me, and uh, it in, inspired me so much that one of my thesis chapters was about this coda and how yes. it works. Yeah, that's why I brought it up. Uh -huh. um, I remember the first five times I heard the Fourth Symphony by Bruckner because people said to me, "If you want to get into Bruckner, you should start with the Fourth Symphony." So I did. Um, it's called the Romantic Symphony. Now, I often have a problem when symphonies get named, whether it's heroic, whether it's pastoral, whether it's pathetic, patetique, mm -hmm. whether it's Paris or Prague, um, just because you are then asked, to, or resurrection, you're asked to think of the music along with the word. So I often try to ignore the word because... To me, at least, when I listened to the Fourth Symphony by Bruckner for the first couple of times, it didn't sound romantic. It sounded to me, and I'm going to be blunt, like someone trying to start a car and it couldn't get the car started. And they kept repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating with the same descending group of notes. Ba -ba -ba -da 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 and it never went anywhere. But then I put it aside for a while. And then I came back to it a few years later and listened. It happened to be a live performance with Daniel Barenboim. And I think it was the Staatskapelle of Berlin, but I'm not certain. And then I began to think, okay, this actually is an interesting piece. And we'll forget about the romantic. And we'll forget about the car that doesn't start. And approach it as an expression of what Bruckner was after and now i like it and i'm working on all the others but i you know 30 years ago this is how i was with Mahler. that i had to work through it and you're still this way with mozart which is fine and but clearly Bruckner speaks to you i know that he was often reviled and ridiculed in his life I know that he dedicated his third symphony to Wagner and he wrote to Wagner and tried to befriend Wagner and Wagner at first was nice to him and encouraging, but then found him a bit much. Um, I know that Bruckner loved the organ. He was from San Anton in Austria and he was apparently a brilliant organist. Apparently he was considerably religious and, but there's the problem we have with any composer that if you apply basic biography and criticism, uh, by that I mean commentary written by people, whether it's music critics or a fellow composer, that that's not the way into the music. That's a way into not liking the music, for example. Mm -hmm. And certain pieces require recovery and restoration and explanation nowadays because they got off on the wrong foot. Berlioz, a lot of Berlioz's music, for example, people still say, eh, it's okay. Whereas for me, it's, it's Nirvana. Mm -hmm. um, what is your way with Bruckner? First, I should say that uh, that subtitle to the Fourth Symphony, Romantic, is suffers a little bit from the same problem that pathetic uh, the Tchaikovsky's sixth suffers pathetic is a French word that doesn't quite translate to pathetic in English so it is not really saying that it's, it's more like emotional or sad same thing in the, the fourth symphony of Bruckner romantic uh, well sure it translates to romantic in English but it's talking about the romanticism not about like uh, trying to woo a lover so romanticism is kind of this broad artistic movement. Maybe it has emphasis on individualism, emotion. It's kind of a response to the industrialization and scientific revolution. So it's about these high emotions. Uh, and I think that's stuff you can hear in the in the symphony a little bit. You've got these strong, what's called the Bruckner rhythm, ba, 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 or other way around. Um, the, the scherzo, the third movement, is a hunting call, uh, like a romantic imagery, right? Romantic with a capital R. That That's one thing. My way into Bruckner, I mean, people uh, the, on, the, on, the, on, on this website that Bruckner fans will all know called abruckner.com, the, there's this section called uh, 
the Brooklyn Thunderbolt phenomenon, uh, and it collects testimonies from people who are struck by a thunderbolt of Bruckner, where they heard it and they're paralyzed, so to speak, and they were like, hey, what's that? Uh, I think I had a moment like this with the coda of the Fourth Symphony that I mentioned, because uh, it's very different from, from everything else that you've heard, maybe, you know, the, these elements start to appear at, uh, in this, in this, I don't know, in this way that you haven't heard before. It, it's kind of difficult to, to speak to, to speak concretely about it. But once you are struck with this Brooklyn Thunderbolt, if you have the fortune of being struck with one, then uh, you start to hear the rest of Bruckner differently too. Uh, the Eighth Symphony, I also did not like when I first heard it. Same with the Ninth Symphony. This, this music is, in contrast to Muller, I would say music that rewards repeated listening and familiarity. Um, you know, the, the Resurrection Symphony of Muller, on the other hand, it punches you in the face, you know, right, right at the beginning with these big symbol crashes. Like, it's difficult to ignore that something big is happening. Uh, on the other hand, Bruckner's Eighth Symphony starts with this, this, this pianissimo tremolo, and then just these two notes, a minor second, and uh, I forget who it was, maybe Schenker, the music theorist called it, it's like the beginning of the world. Mm -hmm. So it's something subtle, it's, it's, not, it's not so in your face, and uh, I think it's easy to lose interest if you're not familiar with what's going on, and you don't have an idea of the structure or the, whole, the wholeness of it. There are certain moments, I think the fourth is maybe the most popular symphony of his for this reason, because it has more accessible moments like this hunting call and this scherzo or this Bruckner rhythm, which is easy to hum, easy to easy to, to, to visualize. Not everyone has this experience. I mean, one thing that is uh, distinctive about Bruckner is that unlike Wagner and maybe even more contrastingly, unlike Brahms, uh, little attention is paid to transitions. One melody finishes, there's a pause, and the next melody starts. Yes. This is very unusual for someone who's accustomed to Brahms or Beethoven, where everything is this continuous thing, and the, the art of transition is its whole, whole separate discipline. And uh, people come to Bruckner and they're like, what is this, like Lego blocks? I mean, this is not music. <laughs> this is why some people were so critical of Bruckner. But to me, it's interesting, like the the... It doesn't mean that that the melodies are not working together. It doesn't mean that there's no development. That's just his style of doing things, and different people like different things, and I happen to like that. Um, speaking of thunderbolts, among the other works you recommended, there were two Bruckners. There was Mahler's Second Symphony, in the famous Leonard Bernstein recording with the New York Philharmonic, 1987. Barbara Hendricks and Krista Ludwig in the Westminster Choir. That was recorded live in what was then called Avery Fisher Hall. Now it's David Keffen Hall with better acoustics. And I went to all four. And I remember that the audience was a little too noisy, but somehow on the recording on Adagio, we don't have the audience noise. Um, I think that recording stands for itself, and I commend it to listeners. I think also that among the works that my guests have named that's probably the one that's most named mm -hmm. of all um but then you have wagner's die valkyra which i can vouch for because <laughs> i i teach the ring all the time i've seen 48 complete cycles and i've seen die valkyra at least 75 times uh in your thesis you have a section from Act One. In the recordings that you recommend to the listener, you have Votan's farewell, the end of the third act. So after the Valkyries have all done their ride and they've gone back to Valhalla, wherever they go, and he, Votan, says goodbye to Brunhilde. And some of the most emotionally wrenching music imaginable and glorious and complex. But mm -hmm. why in your thesis, and this is not a criticism, I loved it, did you pick Mac one Ein Schwert verhis mir der Vater? Speaking of thunderbolts, go ahead. Yeah, uh, there's like a smart answer and a not smart. Well, I okay. want both. Yeah, 
the I, the easy answer is like I wasn't so into Wagner from a music theoretical standpoint, partially because I hadn't listened so much. I mean, I think I, my attention span is not so good for recordings, and it's not so easy to see Wagner live. It's a, you know, it's like a big thing. So the first full ring I heard was actually not until June 2022 in in Budapest. Mm. I heard a partial ring in London in October 2018, but even that was after I finished my my undergrad degree. So I didn't really have a strong exposure to Wagner because somehow like listening to recordings didn't do it for me. And I think with operas like that, it's it's difficult anyway. So that was part of it. The other part I think is that um, my supervisor, uh, Marshall Tuttle, had recommended this one, this aria of 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 that that um, from Die Valkyrie, because it has a lot of interesting things about the way the tonal structure is 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 used in that piece. Uh, C minor is approached from both sides. Uh, it has symbolic significance. So from a music theoretical perspective, that's interesting. I'm sure Wotan's Farewell also has some interesting things, but Wagner is difficult for a music theorist and analyst. Um, you have to have a very strong command of understanding chords and chord tones. And because there's lots of notes, there, there's lots of chromaticism. Um, you have to you have to know you have to know precisely which notes are not part of the chord and which ones are part of the chord. Otherwise, you'll get lost very easily because in, in, in works with so many notes, so many key signatures, so many changing keys, unless you have a strong command of this, it's very easy to just say, oh, it's like a it's like an alphabet soup. There's too many sharps, too many flats. You can't make any sense of it. Um, many, many music theorists hit this dead end. Uh, that was also like the, the hardest chapter of my thesis and probably also the weakest because you can tell there's a very complicated graph and then the amount of text corresponding to that graph is quite small. Like I don't really explain most of what, what's going on. Whereas in the other pieces, like the graphs are not so complicated and the text is kind of adequate. It explains everything, but um, Wagner is a is a is a beast. Um, Tuttle's book, uh, my my supervisor's book, his first book is called Musical Structures in Wagnerian Opera. I re recommend all Wagner fans and all music fans to read it because it really dissects Wagner in a very clear way. Um, you'll find a lot of very muddy written mud, muddy books written about Wagner because it's easy uh, to get lost, as I said, and it's easy to find like turgid, muddy scholarship about it that that makes kind of vague pontifications. But Tuttle's book is like a hot knife through butter. It, it, it clears or a sword path. in a tree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to stick with the subject matter. So yeah. I'm figuring something out about you that I wonder if you know this about yourself. You were just saying that um, this particular scene in Die Valkyrie is in C minor. The symphony number no. two by Mahler that you recommended is in C minor. The Symphony Number no. Eight by Bruckner is in C minor. Um, it brings up what I think is a very valid question, not just about you, but about all of us. Do we connect to different keys, and do they have particular meaning for us without even knowing something is in C minor? In your case, um, I like A major, <laughs> but. Um, are you aware that C minor is a through line in some of your work? Mm, I guess I didn't think of it that way. And now that you mentioned uh, Bruckner's fourth is an E flat major, which is the relative major of C minor, it uses the same notes just in a different way. Maybe. I mean, there, there's this whole sub-discipline of music theory that deals with what is called associative tonality, which is do different keys have different affects, like different things associated with them. And there's some evidence for yes. And yeah, and at the very least, even if you don't have perfect pitch, because they occupy different registers in in oral space, you're going to have different sonorities, right? So this is going to have different effects. I don't know, like, we, if we really want to corroborate this, we'd have to transpose one of these symphonies to a different key and then play it and see how it feels. Who knows? Uh, I'm more inclined to say it's a, a little bit of a coincidence with these specific okay. works that I chose because there's plenty of other pieces that I like that are also not in C minor, but I'm not discounting it as a possibility. But I think the question is, do can people, do you believe, have a particular affinity, and sometimes it's completely physical, with a particular key, the way 
we may have an affinity with a particular voice category or one single voice. So if I were to say to you that everything Marilyn Horn ever sang sounded gorgeous to me, it was not just her fantastic singing, it was the actual voice. And there are other singers I could name that way. Uh, I can name a folk singer who's largely forgotten him, Phil Oakes, who died way too young in the 60s, I guess, early 70s. And his voice, I never saw him. I don't know what he looked like. But something about his voice registers with me. Marilyn Horn, the same. And I could name others where it's just completely the voice, even if they had no other gifts. And these two musicians certainly do. I, as you know, because I we've expressed this today, I believe very strongly that the experience of music is not just in our brain, but in our bodies. And it could well be, and you can disagree with me if you do disagree, that different keys perhaps appeal to different people. It's like having different blood types or metabolisms, all those things. Yeah, certainly. That's that's definitely possible. One thing that shouldn't be left out of the and discussion when when trying to analyze that is that because of the way tuning works in different instruments, different keys are going to be more out of tune than others, especially maybe on a on a piano or something with fixed tuning, because you can't adjust. Um, the equal temperament system is kind of a averaging out of the necess of the of the necessary out of tuneness of trying to temper the tonal system. Uh, so it depends on the instrument, the orchestra, the performer, like how, how all of this is working together. But it's definitely possible that certain keys are going to be more out of tune than others and then could have a certain effect for that reason. You said earlier in our discussion that you are now, because you're still a student, all this brilliance that we've been hearing, you'd think you're 45 years old, but you're not anywhere near that. Mm -hmm. um, you are now in the social sciences. And I told listeners that you're in Mexico City. You were born in London of South Asian background and studied in New York and perhaps elsewhere. Why are you in Mexico City? Yeah, uh, well, after I finished my music and my math degrees, um, I, there were certain things I didn't like about academic musicology, uh, mostly kind of what I alluded to about it being conflated with art and people not, you know, being rigorous about it. So I didn't pursue a graduate studies in music. Math, I was never really good enough at, in my opinion. Like, <laughs> I, you know, I, I managed to get a bachelor's degree and I, you know, that, that was like the, the, my crowning achievement in mathematics. <laughs> so after undergrad, uh, I got a corporate job, you know, just like everybody else. I was working as a technology consultant for for IBM for a half year or so. Didn't really enjoy this. Didn't really, you know, you know, in, didn't really feed my intellectual interest so much, even though I had free time to read. Uh, so since I didn't like that, I got another job as a diplomat. I was a visa officer for the U.S. State Department, and I was sent to Ciudad Juarez in the north of Mexico for two years from the beginning of 2020 to the beginning of 2022. That probably marked my interest in politics more seriously because, you know, being on the inside of this machine, you see very clearly what a border is, how borders keep people out, you know, what a visa really means, all these kinds of things that you maybe only consider abstractly otherwise. So uh, I finished that job at the beginning of this year. And since I already felt somewhat assimilated to Mexico, I just I applied to the National University here in Mexico City, as as well as some others, but uh, the funding here is better. I was able to get a scholarship for a political science master's degree. And yeah, that's how I ended up here. I've been living here in Mexico City for about three months, but I have a little over two years living in, in the country. So it's often asked of young people, especially when they're still in school, they've gone back to school, what do you want to do with this? And I'm not going to ask you that. Yeah. <laughs> but I am going to point out instead a couple of things that art represents a nation. Art can be used in diplomacy. 
the United States in the 1950s, when there was a Cold War and we were officially not speaking with the Soviet Union or not much, yet we sent Louis Armstrong, Lantin Price, many of our performers to communist countries. And they were often the first point of contact. Um, Jacqueline Kennedy, as First Lady in the early 1960s, didn't only go to Paris famously, she went to India, she went to lots of places, and not only brought American culture, but experienced the local culture and brought it to the United States. Um, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, I was in touch with her office, not with her once, because they were, the State Department has an arts division where every embassy and consulate throughout the world that represents the United States has an arts component in which they engage with local people on the arts of the local places, but also bringing arts from the United States and not just our most famous things like country and Western and Broadway musicals and rock and roll, but all kinds of arts. And it's a means for people to gather and connect. Um, we've seen many, many countries in the world, most recently Great Britain, uh, with its many changes of governments and its economic austerity, cut back on the arts or move arts companies, propose to move arts companies out of London to different parts of the UK, which can be argued that why center everything in London when you can put things in Manchester and Leeds and elsewhere, Birmingham, and so I'm not taking position on that, but I guess what I'm asking you is, as you embrace diplomacy and political issues, but you have this very strong, deep background and conviction about the arts, do you see that as a threat in how you approach your studies of political science and diplomacy? Well, I won't get into all the details, but I'll say briefly that I did not leave on good terms from my previous job. And it was kind of like a radicalizing experience for me being on the inside and like seeing the the true grit of like how this works. So um, I developed some convictions there that, and I think I'm not gonna go back to diplomacy, nor can I really, I think with, with, what, with, the, with the kind of history I have with it. So now I, I think I'm more interested in like, uh, well, yeah, I have a strong conviction with the arts and, you know, education and um, academics. And what I'm interested in now in my in my master's thesis and in my political science studies is the way that people are able to access culture and information. Um, living in a third world country is very different from living in a first world country, not just because of uh, basic infrastructure and all this, but also the kinds of things you have access to in in the realms of culture and information you know um maybe the netflix that you have is geo-restricted to exclude certain titles maybe you can't get the same books and it's not just an issue of translation it's an issue of like the publisher doesn't work in this country things like this so having spent some time on the legal side of the world you know doing things the right way now i see a lot of potential in alternative methods of distributing media and and uh, culture and information. The dirty word for it is piracy, but there's plenty of other things that that I think uh, democratize culture, like make things accessible to people. It's an ongoing debate. You know, there's there's a lot to be said for intellectual property, copyright, all these things. None of them are resolved issues, and I don't have a, a super strong position saying that you know nobody deserves to be remunerated for their work. That would be a bit silly. But having Thank lived you. here, and, <laughs> yeah, it would be very silly. But having, having lived here and having seen that a lot of people access uh, great culture of the world through unofficial means, I see a lot of potential in this. And I think it's worth some academic study to see how mm -hmm. things can be distributed in ways that are not mediated through the official channels. That's basically what it's a synthesis of like my previous background in the arts and then my more recent interest in politics. I've had work that I've produced that has been translated into other languages and in certain very large Asian countries that have never paid me a penny or a, a renminbi or any of the other currencies that I could be paid in. And I, you know, I meet people from that very large country 
who said to me, oh, I love your book on classical music. It changed my life. And and I said, did you read it in English or Mandarin? Oh, no, I read it in Mandarin. And um, the problem is that I never got any money for that. And Jesse Norman, who I was privileged to work with a lot, was very anti-pirate recording specifically because, number one, she wasn't compensated for sales. But number two, she didn't have artistic control over the sound recording, the quality, and how it represented her. Um, in my case, I can't tell you how good the translations are of my books in certain languages if I don't speak those languages. So, but I have to hope that someone did a very good job. Now, you were in Mexico City, which I've been to Mexico numerous times, but never to Mexico City. And I have friends there in addition to you, very much music lovers. It is a city that has a long tradition in opera and classical music. And Maria Callas had one of her earliest successes there in the late 1940s in Aida. People can hear this everywhere, uh, where in the second act, she hits an optional E flat that Verdi didn't write. But nonetheless, it was very exciting. And the crowd goes wild. Placio Domingo, though born in Spain, moved to Mexico as a boy and began his musical and performing life in Mexico and obviously went on to do great things. And many young Mexicans, especially tenors, seem to be coming all the time of very high quality. Uh, recently, Javier Camarena, but there are many. And so obviously there is a huge, rich musical life in Mexico City of all types, I'm certain. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you, as a young student still, have you been able to go and experience, quote, classical music, but also every other kind of music in Mexico City? Yeah, um, I still write for Backtrack, this online magazine, occasionally. So uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a performance of Bruckner Eighth, uh, Bruckner's Eighth Symphony here in the by the Orquesta Filamranca de la Ciudad de México. And it was very good. It was very good. And an American conductor did it. Scott Yu, but uh, a Mexican orchestra. Mm -hmm. Really an impeccable performance. One, one of the a very good Bruckner 8 performance. There was also a performance of Mahler's First Symphony a few weeks ago by Gustavo Dudamel in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. There's a, there was a festival here called the Festival Cervantino, uh, which had a number of Mahler symphonies performed. I managed to see the first. But yeah, there's a rich musical life. Uh, I live quite close to the Palacio de Bellas Artes, the Fine Arts Palace. There's a lot of concerts there, mostly chamber music, but some some symphonies also, and a lot of diversity too. Uh, you have your European staple too, but uh, there's a number of Mexican composers that aren't performed so often outside of Mexico, which which get a good good amount of uh, performances here. Is the word Cervantino with a C as in Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote? Yeah, exactly. Okay. In New York City, we have the Cervantes Institute, which is like the Spanish Cultural Institute. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, we're talking about my favorite novel of all. My second favorite is Candide, but mm. Don Quixote is a life changer. And um, I think her name is Edith Grossman, if I remember and she did a wonderful English translation. I read it in Spanish many years ago, uh -huh. but got a lot out of this translation as well. Um, I'm not going to ask you about professionally, but where do you see yourself in the world in the future? And that could be geographically or socially, professionally. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I have a lot of roots in a lot of different places. Uh, you know, I have British citizenship through my father, American one through my mother, um, some roots in India, some theoretical roots in Pakistan, now some roots in, in Mexico. We'll see. I, I, I like traveling around and exploring new places a lot. Uh, now that I'm more or less fluent in Spanish, it opens up a lot of possibilities. Um, the big cultural centers and metropolises in the rest of Latin America, that would be interesting to see. If I enjoy the master's degree, it could be a good idea to pursue a PhD in one in one of these places. Mm, so I don't I don't have uh, fixed plans right now, but I do know that I like moving around. 
and now it's 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 possible now i feel a little bit more liberated now that i've burned through a corporate job and a public sector job i feel a little bit more confident <laughs> that i don't have to do the traditional things anymore well i'm a huge fan of buenos aires argentina um for all kinds of reasons including culturally when i left working in the metropolitan opera full-time although i continued to do stuff with them for many years the first place i went was buenos aires to work in the teatro colon Mm -hmm. and i've been back a few times it's a very complex society in the best way wonderful bookshops um an incredible audience and love for music um a very large population from many parts of the world especially italy but also germany uh a very large jewish population an asian population and therefore it's a remarkable mix. It's a, it's a country that 1908, when they built the Tatra Cologne, was wealthier than Canada. It was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So what you have is the legacy of wealth and immigration and greatness. And now the greatness is different. The, it's the greatness of a society that has structural problems, but such a remarkable culture and such a passion for everything they do whether it's football soccer whether it is psychoanalysis and you know it's said that vienna new york and buenos aires buenos aires are the three cities with the most psychoanalysts in the world it's a good place for musical psychology the institutions that they have there are contradictory the food is fantastic and it's just very different because it's big and its bigness means that it can embrace all kinds of things it's a contradictory society it has the antarctic it has climate change it has all kinds of animals that we don't see elsewhere it has huge magnificent waterfalls i sound like i'm the argentine tourist office but um people who are into culture need to spend a lot of time in buenos aires because in many ways it feels the way Paris must have felt in the 1920s, the way Berlin must have felt in the 1920s, the way Vienna must have felt in 1900, the way New York might have been in 1945. Um, it still has all of these echoes, plus a very profound, deeply rooted culture of its own and good academic institutions. And the Pope is Argentine. And yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's it punches way above its weight artistically and culturally and it's just a fascinating place and i you know based on what we've spoken about today i think you'd fit in there very well so that's just my unsolicited advice yeah i've yeah. never been but I, I have colleagues who are working with professors there my university has a connection with some universities there and yeah, like like Mexico City, which is the the largest city in the Americas by by population, Buenos Aires is this other metropolis and a big big cultural center for sure. Yeah. So Vishnu Bakani, keep everyone aware of what you're doing. You have a website. Yes, uh, Vishnu Bachani dot com. Bachani, excuse me. <laughs> no worries. I think of Bach. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't um, updated it in a while. It's mostly stuff from my undergrad years, but okay. soon I'll, I'll put up some more current things. But this way people can find you because you're a fascinating guy. I knew that the day I met you. And Likewise. I thank you. I encourage you to keep up your, your very original and good work. And I want people to read you and follow you. And uh, maybe I'll be in Buenos Aires with you and we'll go hear a Bruckner performance and you'll explain to me what's going on. All yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vishnu. Thanks, Fred. It was good talking to you. Likewise. Until next time. Yes.